And I'm in the something else entirely camp. Uh, I don't think this is in a meaningful sense a new Cold War. I mean, I'm actually just writing a paper on this and, and um, you know, history rarely repeats itself. Um, though people have a tendency to think that it does. And that's in part because of historical laziness. I mean, we have this tendency to think that what we ourselves have experienced is much more significant than what has gone before. So therefore we try to connect what is happening today and what we see in the future to our own personal experience. That is for some of us. I realize that both of you who are listening in Budapest today are probably much too young to have experienced this, but unfortunately many policymakers and other leaders are not. Uh, so that's the, that's the first reason. But the other reason more serious, um, I think it is that there is a bit of a danger in thinking that all confrontational um, uh, inimical international systems have something of the Cold War in them. I mean, to me, the, the international situation today looks much more, and I say this unfortunately, the, the perfect preface, unfortunately, much more like the world in the late 19th century than it looks like anything that we knew from the Cold War. This world is not bipolar, it is definitely multipolar, as we are seeing today. The United States and China are the strongest poles, but their influence over the world are, is, is much, much less than what was the case during the bipolar uh, US-Soviet international system. It's not driven by rival ideologies to the same extent that there is a tension between authoritarianism and democracy, but th there is no full-fledged ideological system of, of the Marxist-Leninist kind to confront um, uh, liberal capitalism. And we can go on and on. So, I mean, the, the, there are some similarities, but the differences by far outweigh the similarities in, in my view. And one needs to take that into consideration because for two reasons. I mean, the, the, the one is learning from the past, which I think we can do, but then we have to you know, deal with it with, with tact and grace and understanding. Um, but the other one is thinking that the Cold War, after all, um, in, in, in Europe and most of Asia, had a kind of deadly stability to it. The world that we are looking at now is very unstable. Um, and we have to get to, to grips with that. And, and even that, the comparison to the Cold War really isn't all that helpful. Well, thank you very much. That was a very good question and a very good answer. And. Um... <clears throat> Um, of course, this could be a debated issue uh, for many other people, but I think uh, serious uh, <coughs> uh, historians will absolutely agree with you, and I'm very happy that you are reinforcing what I was thinking about the same thing, and what I'm telling my students when uh, this comes up uh, time to time at classes, and um, absolutely, so I think uh, you, you perfectly uh, highlighted the most important differences. Uh, of the two systems, and, uh, and uh, this is very important to emphasize because uh, it's not so uh, not so uh, well known because uh, the the, the um, similarities seem to be for a lot of people, everyday people, uh, more important, um, mm. and it's so easy to label it a new Cold War. I mean, you know how it is in journalism, uh, the juicy thing is the most important factor. And uh, a second Cold War, a new Cold War, whatever, it, it's a much juicier uh, label than to explain something like, like you have done so right now. Okay, and uh, so because of this, it's very important that we uh, try our best to, to make, uh, make it clear that this is really uh, two different things. So thank you very much. And then the floor is still open, and we have uh, one first, um, uh, sorry, there was one young man. Uh, oh, yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Please uh, speak up so that he can hear us. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks for your wonderful presentation, Professor Rasta. Uh, I have a, a question about the U.S.-American relationship. Uh, I wonder why Americans choose to engage with China and let it to join the WTO rather than uh, contain or isolate China to put uh, the maximum pressure on China to force it to the political transition in the 1990s under like uh, Americans' hegemonic position, like uh, yeah, under the, yeah. after the Cold War. That's another really good question. So I think this goes back to 
what I talked about, about the general U.S. approach to the world in the 1990s and, and early 2000s, which was based on this principle that a rising tide lifts all boats. It was, the, the Cold War was over. The idea was that it was necessary to try to figure out how to integrate in economic capitalist terms the rest of the world into the framework that the United States and before that Britain had set up in terms of global economic interaction. And the sense was, and this was a deeply ideological position in my view, which I'm also writing about in, in, in the paper I'm doing now, um, that this was not just more important than uh, new kinds of security arrangements. I mean, you saw this with regard to Russia as well um, in the 1990s and, 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 and early 2000s. But also that, it, that this form of economic integration, capitalist economic integration, globalization, would in the end somehow um, mysteriously, almost magically, resolve the political tensions and the strategic difficulties uh, between and among races, which would have been, in my view, perfectly possible in the 1990s. Um, it would be difficult, just like integrating Russia in any meaningful sense would be difficult. But not trying was a big, big mistake, because this was the moment where there was a chance for these things to have worked out. Not like that, right, as we see in today. So, you know, it's not that I was against the idea that um, uh, China and others uh, should have access to trade on, on, on equal and regulated terms through the WTO. It was the omissions in other areas. Okay, thank you very much. And, and one last question here. Uh, I'm sorry. We unfortunately have a very tight schedule, which will be very difficult to um, uh, meet. So please, uh, the last question. Hello, Professor Vesta. Uh, my name is Inta Khan, and I'm a first-year student, a PhD student of history at the University of Washington. And thank you so much for your talk. And I just have a really kind of simple, kind of uh, might be a dumb question, which might be more relevant to the kind of the how to do the Cold War history. So my question would be like, to what extent do you think a Cold War historian or the students who are learning about the Cold War history and the methodology? Uh, should so we are learning about the past and to what extent do you think we have to uh feel the kind of the obligation to provide a kind of certain kind of practical answer to the current agenda or like a political economic question today so like you're studying about the past and past is already always kind of relevant to the present but what would be a kind of like good part but also kind of the pitfall that we have to avoid if we are kind of too obsessed with a kind of the agenda of explaining the present through the of the past. Right. That's a really good question. Um, I mean, the, the two things we should watch for, first and foremost, and, 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 and um, make sure that we avoid, is first to read history backwards. It's so very easy to do that. I, almost every day, in terms of my own work as an historian, because I have, up to now, been dealing with the very recent past, um, I find myself doing that, and then have to take a step back. Uh, the people we are dealing with as historians did not know the future. They couldn't even really guess well about the future, just like we can't guess well about the future. They had to go on the information that they actually had. So what we need to do as historians is painstakingly finding out what kind of information was available to them. Uh, what is reasonable to expect that they would be able to think about? You know, ordinary people just as, as leaders. Right? Um, and what they're their uh, ideas and their viewpoints uh, would have been developed from that kind of understanding and, and, and historical background. So that's the first issue. I think the second issue, which is really important for those of us, like myself, who are interested in drawing on history in order to understand today's world, is that we start with, that our, our starting point for that enterprise is a very thorough study of history. So what I do not like and often get quite angered by are people who, who have political um, uh, ideas and perceptions, whether they're historians or not, uh, uh, does not matter in, in, this, in this case, who are 
drawing selectively from history in order to prove a current day political point. And that's exactly what we shouldn't do. So if, you, if you're an historian, you should start with the study of the past. But some people say history for history's sake, which is actually not a bad way of putting it. Right? You start by studying the past on its own terms. You start by studying in-depth historiography, which I'm very keen to get my students here at Yale to do. You know, uh, you, you start by that study, and from that, you then try to draw, you know, what do you honestly see as the key elements that have created the kind of world that we live in today? Not as a kind of warning, not in order to score political points, but as honestly as you can, based on your own understanding of the past. I think that's what really matters. And, and we see, particularly in the United States, where I, I do most of my work, a lot of people sinning against that, you know, that basic approach. But I do think it is really, really important. And this is not just an argument to get more people to study history. It's first and foremost an argument for how historians practice their, their own craft. OK, thank you very much. Uh, I think we can, uh, we can, we can thank uh, Professor uh, Arne Vestet um, um, for being with us and for sharing um, uh, his ideas about the Cold War and China and the US-China relations and many other things. So I think uh, we have been lucky uh, to have this. Uh, and hopefully at uh, some other conference, perhaps next year, we will be even, uh, even happier when we can have him in person uh, at our conference. So we'll be working on that. Uh, Wonderful. I mean, Thank you very much. Robert. It's great to see you. Great to meet everyone who is here. And I hope to see you again in person in Budapest next year. Absolutely. So thank you very much again and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The U.S. claim of support for the free exchange of ideas, these scientists openly criticized and sometimes even contradicted official government policy. But for other scientists, how to be responsible to the public was a little bit more complicated. By the mid-1950s, geneticists were rapidly uncovering new disturbing facts about the prevalence of genetic mutations in humans. Most unsettling to them, these mutations appeared to have numerous causes, not all of which were tied to environmental exposure. Geneticists began to recognize the ways that preserving mutations in the gene pool had resulted from advances in medical technologies. Driven by their new responsibility to the public, geneticists believed it was their duty to find not only a way to inform the public of what they had learned, but also develop solutions to these emerging problems. The loudest voice of concern came from Nobel Prize winning geneticist Herman Muller. Muller had been awarded the Nobel Prize in 1946 for discovering that X-ray irradiation of cells caused uh, mutations. It was in fruit flies. That's, he's a fruit fly guy. All right. uh, and, sorry, just side note. Um, so in 1955, he was already concerned about what was happening um, with the mutations sort of proliferating around humans from medical technologies. And he publishes um, a sort of some findings in Scientific American with the, with the ominous prediction that if the mutation rate of genes in humans increases because of radiation exposure, it will irrevocably degrade humanity. Muller came to these conclusions partially through his work with the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission, where he was studying the effects of radiation on the Japanese after the war. So he did not think that humanity could survive additional mutations and was really very alarmed about this. Other, he and other geneticists wanted to protect humanity. That was their idea. And they thought that the best way to do it would be to ensure that, I'm quoting, 20% of the population who possess more genetic defects than average fail to live until maturity, or if they do live, fail to reproduce. The genetic deterioration that he was trying to ward off, he believed, would lead to our extinction as a species. Biologist Francis Crick, known for the, you know, part of the DNA team, shared this sentiment when he said that we scientists all agree that on a long-term basis, we have to do something about the problem of genetic deterioration. And because public opinion on this subject is so far behind, we should do something about it now. But what are they going to do? Many geneticists in the post-war era, like so many scientists from past and present, saw science as universal, objective, separate from society and culture. They believed that if the public only had the scientific 
facts, they would draw the same conclusions as scientists and would use these conclusions to make different choices or in some cases sacrifices in their private lives, such as opting not to have children if you have a heritable disease. So in 1956, when Muller's former colleague um, and fellow geneticist Charlotte Auerbach wrote a book titled Genetics in the Atomic Age, they thought they had found their solution. The book was aimed at the general public and was celebrated by geneticists for clearly outlining the role of the hereditary materials in life and evolution and the consequences of mutation for humanity. They thought, the other scientists who read this book thought that this enabled the reader to weigh for themselves the various factors and be able to make those reproductive choices um, on their own. However, despite approval from scientists, genetics in the atomic age with its dry technical prose and textbook-like illustrations did not lead to a surge in the public interest of genetics. Geneticists had overestimated the public's motivation to slog through a bland presentation of facts and underestimated the myriad of social and cultural factors that influenced the public understanding of science. Frustrated at what they determined was the public's unwillingness to engage with science and alarmed about the potential for genetic apocalypse, geneticists forged ahead with alternative solutions that they themselves created. In 1961, Herbert Muller proposed the creation of sperm banks so that people could choose germinal material from donors of outstanding ability and vigor rather than propagate their own lesser quality gene. At a genetic symposium in 1962, he gave a lecture titled, Should We Weaken or Strengthen Our Genetic Heritage? In it, he argued that genetics and eugenics should work together to seek to increase the frequency of characteristics valued by man, including depth and breadth of intellectual capacity, moral courage and integrity, and an appreciation of nature and art. Muller was fully aware that in 1962, these traits could not, be, could not be traced to individual genes, but he also believed that genetic science was advancing so quickly that it would only be a matter of time until that was the case. And so he saw these eugenic practices of selective breeding as a way to kind of bridge the gap between what we know now and what we're going to know very soon. What is perhaps most revealing about all of this is how many geneticists agreed with Muller about the necessity and value of eugenic solutions to this problem that they're perceiving of mutations. After Muller's speech in 1962, Francis Crick said, I agreed with practically everything Muller said with a few small reservations. His reservations were not moral but practical. He just wasn't sure that they could be done. <laughs> He didn't oppose trying at all. Sir Brian Medawar, a British biologist, was more concerned and he said, what frightens me most about Muller and others is that is their extreme self-confidence, their complete conviction that not only they know what ends are desirable, but the, also that they know how to achieve them. Yet, oh, where's my sixth page? Yeah. Oh, it's on the other side. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> all right, backside it, right? Yet he clarified right quickly after he agreed with that, that he doesn't think we should rule these things out, but we just should confirm how to do them first. U.S. scientists' post-war attempts at science communication did not work as they had expected. Atomic scientists in the U.S. attempts to rally the public around opposition to nuclear weapons and testing, they attempted to do this, but these movements didn't truly manifest until really the 1970s, and they were led by public citizens, not scientists. For geneticists, driven by fears of you know, um, mutations and an overwhelming degradation of humanity, um, thought that they could educate the public on what the science and the science that they were thinking about and learning and concluding from, and that people would take that information and use it to make their own free reproduction, reproductive decisions. So not only um, did they misunderstand people, and they also understood, misunderstood the nature of scientific knowledge and how it is constructed. Physicists and geneticists mediating their relationship to the public and assuming leading roles in determining government and international agencies' policies also raises larger questions about who controls scientific research and its interpretations and how the space between production and understanding of science is bridged. By revealing the early Cold War period as one of scientist-led innovation in the realm of public communication of science, I'm trying to demonstrate the highly politicized and subjective nature of science and scientific evidence and call into question the very notion that there is an objective science that can be trusted. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Erin. Especially you saved us some time. You were so fast in speaking that we have, we have gained some time. Oh, great. Okay. And, Hope and not, too fast. That, not too fast, right? Well, a I think too fast. not too fast, but okay. fast enough. Okay, I mean, great. I would say that. And if I think that if there is one, one uh, uh, piece of knowledge that comes through is that uh, science has a moral side to it and science <laughs> is also dual use not just nuclear issues okay. so uh, we will come back to that I okay. hope everyone will have a lot of questions I do myself so but now I would like to turn to Julia Julia Claritia uh, who is from uh, the Cold War archives who, who is a Cold War archives research fellow under the Wilson Center so you are no, not together, because you are in Roma. Uh, yes, right? but we spent a few days But you spend a few days time and again together. You are also a PhD candidate. And you wrote to me that you, you have changed a little bit the title. You shortened a little bit the title. So the title of your presentation would be Following the Roots of CIA Networks in Italy, the Relations Between Italian Antifasc Antifascists and the OSS from World War II to the early Cold War. So you also have 20 minutes. You don't have to hurry that much. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much, Professor, for the introduction. And also, thank you very much for the organizers of this conference for the opportunity to be here. Uh, for me, as for many of you, probably this is the first in-person conference after a long time. So I'm really excited about that. Um, as the professor said, uh, my paper is entitled Following the Roots of CIA Networks in Italy. And it is um, a small part of my larger PhD pro uh, project. My paper is meant to explain uh, why I believe that the relations between Italian anti-fascists and the Office of Strategic Services, the wartime predecessor of the CIA, uh, were crucial for the setting of the early Cold War CIA's network in Italy. Why? Uh, I believe that the connections between Italian anti-fascists and American agents in fact became, um, in the early Cold War, a fertile ground for the ideation and the development of CIA anti-communist strategy towards Italy. They also created, in a broader sense, a background for the construction of the relation between Italy and the United States in the post-war. So, the reason why I <laughs> the reason why I decided to, um, ask to, to have this perspective is that uh, the historians um, that dealt with the uh, CIA strategy in Italy in the early Cold War agree on the fact that CIA's action partly relied on the previous source experience. Uh, at the same time, this link uh, between the war years and the post-war years is often considered as given and neglected. And so, with my PhD project in general, and in, in a smaller part with this presentation, I would like to deepen this link um, and explain why I believe that individual ties uh, between Italian anti-fascists and former OSS agents represented one of the major legacies of the OSS experiences um, in Italy. So, uh, these uh, uh, relations between Italian anti-fascists and OSS agents um, in some cases persisted after the war years and in the Cold War represented a channel of cooperation between Italian anti-communist elite and um, United States agents. However, uh, to look in details in how uh, these networks evolved, it is necessary to give you a little brief uh, overview of how these relations between Italian anti-fascists and American agents had origins uh, were developed and evolved in the early Cold War years. So, Italian anti-fascists were the first and major interlocutors of American agents um, during the war. Um, the agents that, uh, of course, were assigned to deal with the Italian case. And this happened even before the Allied troops landed in Italy in 1943, but also even before the US even entered the conflict. So, the networks uh, between American agents and Italian anti-fascists um, at origins, uh, in fact, at the beginning of the at the very beginning of the 1940s, um, after the fall of France uh, in the summer of 1940, um, many uh, Italian anti-fascist leaders that were in exile there moved to the United States, and they carried on 
there are anti-fascist political activity over there, uh, often in cooperation with the Italo-American communities. Mm, in the very same period, uh, the Roosevelt administration, uh, even during US neutrality, started to realize the fact that it was necessary to establish some sort of secret services agency to face the issues that the state of war in Europe brought up. And so they established in July 1941 the coordinator of information that then evolved um, in the summer of 1942 in the more structured Office of Strategic Services. So a few months after the effective entrance of the US in the war. Um, so um, it's in this phase uh, that the first contacts between Italian anti-fascists and American agents um, took place. Um, it is important to underline, uh, because it will be useful for what comes next, that um, within Italo Italian uh, anti-fascist communities in the United States, um, even at the beginning of the 1940s, there were strong elements of anti-communism. Um, to give you a sense of that, uh, just think that the most important anti-fascist association in the United States uh, during the war excluded since the beginning any kind of cooperation with the few uh, Italian, anti, anti -com uh, Italian communists and communist sympathizers that were in the United States. And this is really interesting because probably <coughs> this uh, background of anti-communist ideals um, became a fertile ground for an anti-communist cooperation in the early Cold War. So in this case, um, Italian anti-fascists sought support for their uh, political anti-fascist activity in the United States uh, and to represent uh, an alternative Italy uh, opposite to the fascist Italy. On the, uh, on the other hand, American agents needed reliable interlocutors, uh, interlocutors to figure out what was going on in Italy uh, and to find internal allies for the imminent perspective that they had of the Italian campaign so they needed reliable allies in Italy. Uh, it's, of course, after the entrance of the US in the conflict that um, the Roosevelt administration started to see Italian anti-fascists more and more as a useful tool in this sense. Uh, between 1943 and 1945, during the Italian campaign, uh, the OSS networks that had origins in the United States uh, moved to Italy. And it is at this time that also the Italian anti-fascists that did not leave for exile in the previous years entered the network. I underline this because uh, I'm going to show you in a few slides um, one of my dissertation case study. And the, protagonist, the Italian protagonist of this case study entered the network in this specific phase between 1943 and 1945 because he didn't go to exile. So um, after the war ended and the OSS was officially dismissed, um, many relations that had origins in OSS networks um, actually survived and persisted in the post-war year. However, um, to explain how these relations branched off in the complex and multidimensional environment that characterizes the Cold War and CIA's action in Italy and Western Europe more in general, as I said, it would be necessary to bring the analysis to um, a more specific level, individual level. But before that, um, a little bit of context about the situation in Italy in the post-war years. Um, at the end of World War II, Italy had uh, the strongest Western Communist Party um, and a very, very complicated economic and social situation. So uh, the fear for a seize of power by the communists was largely perceived both um, in the US and among Italian anti-communist elites. And this, uh, in this context, anti-communists became, therefore, a bonding factor between American and Italian elites, as anti-fascist was during the war. And this happened both at an official and diplomatic level, but also at an unofficial, uh, private, and in some cases, covert level. And it's on this second level that my analysis is focused. So going towards the, uh, can we switch? Going towards the, my case study, um, this is based on the friendship of, on the relation between the Italian Alfredo Pizzoni and the American Ellen Dance. Alfredo Pizzoni, during the Second World War, was the president of the Committee of National Liberation for Northern Italy, 
which was the organization that managed resistance and partisan groups in the northern part of Italy, as the name suggests. Um, after the war, Pizzoni officially left politics, and he became the director of the Credito Italiano Bank, uh, which is nowadays Unicredit, maybe you've heard about it, and even at the time was one of the most important banks in Italy. Uh, however, uh, he uh, kept many important friendships uh, that he made with Anglo-American uh, officers during the war. And one of these friends that he kept very close was Ellen Dahls, which is who is much more well known as CIA director from 1953 to 1961. But you have to know that during the war, um, Dahls was uh, the OSS chief uh, of uh, the Berg Station in Switzerland. And there, one of his mentions was to deal with the Italian resistance and uh, to have uh, Italian anti-fascist as interlocutors. And one of them was Pizzoni. Uh, they met in 1944 uh, during one of Pizzoni's mission in Switzerland yeah, as a president of the delegation of the CL and AI. Um, in this situation, Pizzoni was trying to get as much as possible from the Anglo Americans for the Italian resistance in terms of fundings, equipments, and also political reconnaissance. Um, and he uh, earned um, much respect in his role from the Anglo Americans. Um, and as I said, one of uh, the very important contacts that he was able to establish was the one with Ellen Dahls. And their relationships lasted until Pizzoni's death in 1958. Um, as I said, Pizzoni left politics and went back to his previous <coughs> financial career, while Ellen Dahls, as you might know, uh, remained in the intelligence environment uh, even before the establishment of the CIA in 1947, uh, so in this like uh, intermediate phase between 1945 and 1947. And uh, their friendship is witnessed, um, can we switch slide please? Uh, is witnessed by their correspondence um, that can be found in both their personal papers. Oh, thank you. Um, and uh, their friendship, their relationship, uh, lied on a subtle line between a personal friendship and a political connection to exploit. To give you a sense of that, um, in 1946, Pizzoni wrote Dahls a letter, and in this letter, he um, talked very seriously about the importance of establishing a delegation of Italian men, uh, I quote, to build the new channel of intercourse between the two countries. And he continues, will you kindly use your influence, so your influence, uh, so that they should be sent across. So he's trying to exploit somehow their relationship uh, for a political goal. Uh, but then in the very same letter, he continues asking his friend cigarettes because tobacco was really complicated to find in Italy. So there's like uh, a subtle line between a political official relationship and a friendship. So they also met many times um, during the post-war years. Um, officially in the occasion of Pizzoni's trips in the United States working for the Credito Italiano Bank. And Pizzoni's diaries that are held uh, in his personal papers in um, the Retipari archive in Milan uh, offer an incredible witness of how Pizzoni kept his wartime connections alive in the post-war years while also developing a new, a whole new network with American financial and political elites. So there's, again, this double line of um, officially working for a very important bank and at the same time establishing political connection. To give you an example, um, in 1941, in February 1941, the timing is really important because it was just a few weeks before the signing of the Atlantic Pact, uh, when it was still unclear if Italy would have been part of it, uh, Pizzoni was in the United States and tried to exploit his contacts in the army that he made during the war years and in intelligence to understand if the American strategy foresaw to include Italy in its defense line. Just to give you an example. Um, a second aspect of their relationship that I want to deepen, oh sorry, <laughs> I switched to mine but not to that one. Um, a second aspect that deserves to be deepened is um, more uh, connected with anti-communist action. Uh, some events uh, that took, places, uh, took place between 1953 and 1956 help us see how 
this relationship between Pizzoni and Dalz has <coughs> some outcomes that um, has something to do with CIA action in Italy, um, and most in particular with anti-communist covert propaganda. In fact, in 1953, uh, during one of Pizzoni's trips in the United States, Dalz introduced him to another very important character of the Eisenhower administration related to Cold, the Eisenhower administration Cold War strategy, who is Charles Douglas Jackson. Uh, Charles Douglas Jackson was, even during the war years, the father of the OSS psychological warfare strategy, and he was Eisenhower advisors for this matter too. And uh, Jackson uh, and Dulles introduced, uh, involved Pizzoni uh, in a, some kind of covert propaganda plan for Italy. Uh, that had to include uh, the collaboration with a newspaper called Reader's Digest. It is not totally clear at this point to me which kind of role Pizzoni had in this covert propaganda project, uh, but papers that I found in the Jackson um, collection at the Eisenhower Library clearly states that Pizzoni was involved in it. So it's, it is something that should be uh, dig even more. Uh, yes, I'm going towards the conclusion. And, um, in 1956, another small example, uh, Pizzoni, uh, in another trip that he made in the United States, these trips were really, really meaningful, um, played the role as intermediary for a passage of money from the CIA and Dulles itself, himself, to another former protagonist of Italian resistance that became a strong anti-communist in the post-war years, whose name is Edgardo Sogno. He was looking for funding for his project of anti-communist propaganda um, that was connected with the movement uh, Pace e Libertà in Italia and Peace and Freedom uh, as a literal translation. And so Pizzoni played this role as like really physical intermediary for this passage of money from the CIA to Pace e Libertà movement. So in conclusion, uh, this example shows how the relations, thank you, how the relations between Italian anti-fascists and OSS agents left an important legacy for the CIA anti-communist activity in Italy, as they became a channel of for anti-communist action that both parts, the Italian and the American, had interest in exploiting. Such relation represented, moreover, the core for the development of new, mainly anti-communist-oriented transatlantic networks. And such networks embraced the diversity of the dimension where anti-communist actions were de developed in the Cold War, finance, uh, economic aid, culture, propaganda, and so on. Also, the biographical personal perspective is tied with the complex political and strategic dimension of the Cold War. And in this entanglement between individual relationships, more or less covert anti-communist strategies, international politics, many deeper questions can raise. Uh, like how this persistent network between Italian anti-fascists and American agents influence the, perspe the, perspe uh, sorry, the perception of the Truman and then the Eisenhower administration towards Italy and towards the portion of the society that they should consider as a lie, or did the fact that anti-communist was largely perceived um, in this person ideals years before what we consider being the beginning of the Cold War had an influence um, in terms of the weight of its uh, Italian interlocutors in the elaboration of the CIA strategy in the post-war, in the post years war, uh, in the post-war years. Sorry. So I hope that my dissertation will help answer this question and actually raise even more. Thank you very much for the attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, Julia. This was a very interesting topic. I'm sure that many of us haven't even thought of that before. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that there would be questions or remarks afterwards. Also, thank you for keeping to the time. Very, very nice. And now I would like to ask uh, Abigail Skarka, who is the one and only MA student on our panel. Uh, she is from Harvard University, Cambridge, USA, and she is she has brought us another rather interesting topic, the physicists and the Pope, how Victor Weisskopf steered Vatican nuclear weapons policy development. So Abigail, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, so I'm looking at how the Vatican became a site of nuclear weapons policy under John Paul II in the 1980s. It's a bit of a study in how religion, politics, and science interact. 
Uh, so first, I wanted to start off by talking about the framing of the Cold War as holy war. Um, so the U.S. under Truman framed the conflict as the God-fearing West versus the godless Soviets. Truman was someone who really um, favored theism over denomination. He didn't really mind, it uh, didn't matter to him what religion someone had, so long as they had that sort of fear of God in them. He didn't trust those who didn't have religion. And that could be said of much of the West. Um, and it was a really helpful way for the West to frame this conflict because it sort of gave people something to organize around. It really helped them other the enemy. At the same time, Bolshevism itself could be considered cultic in its own way. Um, it had its own rituals, its own saints, if you will, um, its own commandments, that kind of thing. Uh, and so in this way, it really did appear to be something like a holy war. Um, and one other dimension that makes it seem a bit more uh, religious in a way is the advent of nuclear technology, which introduces this dimension of apocalypse. And so we're not talking about traditional war anymore as, as the risk, but now we're talking about the end of humanity. Um, and that's something that you can see in sci-fi narratives at the time that kind of capture the cultural re resonance of these Armageddon fears. Um, at the same time, it's not, uh, it's not like a crusade in that there is no uh, entrance of the Vatican in a formal way. Uh, Truman sought the formal alliance of Pope Pius at the time, who was actually quite interested. He was a staunch anti-communist, tried to excommunicate all communist Catholics. Um, but because of American legislative quirks, they weren't able to actually achieve that formal alliance. And by the time that um, Pius ended his papacy, the next pope was more interested in creating a dialogue behind the Iron Curtain. Um, and this, this sort of open endorsement of American perspective and strategy became a thing of the past, past and the Vatican sought to reposition itself as a kind of neutral arbiter of peace. Um, at the same time, the entrance of the Vatican into um, Cold War discourse made more sense from a um, technological perspective. So instead of taking a geopolitical stance, um, the Vatican instead came out on the question of nuclear weapons and nuclear technology. Um, this made a lot of sense, uh, given the legacy of just war doctrine, um, which was developed under Augustine of Hippo. Um, it was sort of this, it was seeking to reconcile this early Christian anxiety about um, the commandment thou shalt not kill with the reality that sometimes your neighbor attacks you and you have to defend yourself. Um, so it contains two different dimensions. There's use in bellum and use ad bellum. Use ad bellum describes the conditions under which it is just to go to war. Um, are you, is it a defensive war? You know, are, are your reasons just? And use in bellum describes a just practice in war. Just practice in war. Um, what's a war crime? What is acceptable in the eyes of God? Uh, is behavior in war. Um, and nuclear weapons are a pretty significant use in bellow issue. Um, it gets floated at Vatican II, which is a pretty significant ecumenic, ecumenical conference that takes place under Pius. Um, and in, at Vatican II, they describe the fear of scientific weapons, which is a bit more coded language, um, and condemn them pretty overtly, saying any act of war which is aimed indiscrimin indiscriminately at entire cities is a crime against God and humanity itself. Um, but at the same time, they don't take a stance on the issue of deterrence, which will be kind of the biggest issue for the Vatican in this time. Um, so we know that they don't think it's just to use these weapons in war, but is it just to maintain an arsenal for the purposes of deterring your enemy? Um, and, and that is kind of the open question of the time. And that's where John Paul comes in. Um, he is the first, so he's, he becomes Pope in 1978. He's the first pope from Poland. He is also the first pope who's not from Italy um, since the 16th century. And um, this context is significant. He co he's coming from behind the Iron Curtain, and he is described as unmistakably hostile towards communism. He, he also would later be credited with helping to end Polish communism by, um, by actors in Poland. Uh, and yet, at the same time, this conception of the church as apolitical persisted. A UN representative said that the pontiff's authority is beyond any doubt under no political influence from right or left. Um, and so somehow he's able to maintain this kind of status as, for some, a symbol of anti-communism and, and for much of the rest of the world, someone who's just seen as a promoter of peace and goodwill among man. And that's able to get him in front of um, heads of state and the relevant parties. 
It's also worth noting that John Paul II had an unprecedented interest in science. Um, he is the first pope to hold a meeting of his scientists over which he presided, and um, cardinals were in attendance. So this is um, in November 1979. Uh, he held a commemoration of the 100th anniversary of Einstein's birth. Um, this was his idea. He talked about the value of pure science. He talked about um, the mutual importance of religious and scientific freedom. And he even apologized for the church's treatment of Galileo. Uh, <laughs> so he, he presided over this meeting, which was with him and his cardinals and the Pontifical Academy of Sciences which is a kind of subsidiary arm of the Vatican, uh, consisting of uh, scientists and experts across denominations, religious denominations, and across disciplines, who advise the curia on questions of science um, and helping them to make their ethical and moral evaluations based on scientific fact um, that they might not necessarily be privy to without this help. Um, it had its roots in the the 17th century, and, and Galileo was actually a member before his excommunication. Um, and so it's in this context that John Paul II is enticed to engage the nuclear question, although it's not entirely clear the extent to which it was his own idea um, or the idea of his scientists, most notably Victor Weisskopf. Um, Victor Weisskopf was a Viennese Jew uh, who emigrated to the United States. And uh, he was once approached by a reporter saying, wasn't it you who gave the Pope the idea to talk about nukes? And he said, the Pope gets his inspiration from God, not a Viennese Jew. <laughs> uh, and so Weisskopf worked, um, he worked uh, first at the University of Rochester in the United States after he had to flee um, in World War II. And then he uh, moved on to working on the Manhattan Project and finally at MIT. Working on the Manhattan Project was not an easy decision for him. He struggled with the idea of, um, of building a nuclear, nuclear bomb, and he actually mentioned that he hoped that it would not be possible. Um, but given that it was possible, it was important to him that it be the United States that possessed that power. Uh, at the same time, he did not always believe that it used that power appropriately. He said that the bombing of Nagasaki could be considered a crime. Um, and he did spend the rest of his life after working on the Manhattan Project uh, advocating for nuclear arms control. Uh, and he took great uh, advantage of his position on the Pontifical, Pontifical Academy um, to that end. So as soon as John Paul II acceded to the papacy, uh, he began lobbying him on nuclear arms control. He said that he was seeking strong positive statements for arms control and reduction that he understood could not be too specific given the Pope's uh, responsibilities but that it had to be more than a general statement. And he was asking for things like stop nuclear weapons testing, stop the production of weapons-grade uranium and plutonium, urge a no first use agreement, and prohibit the emplacement of nuclear weapons in locations which, if attacked, would <coughs> create legal radioactive fallout over populated and cultivated areas. Um, and, and so over these next years, he's advising the Pope on the potential consequences of nuclear war for humanity, um, and trying to give him really a sense of why this is an important thing to talk about. Um, but he doesn't come out and say, uh, he doesn't give moral recommendations. And that's the part that kind of remains opaque. That's the tragedy of this project is that I can't see what's in the Pope's mind when he gets this uh, information from his scientists. But I do know what they said to him and what, what he said in speeches. Um, so the Pope begins engaging this more openly uh, as early as 1980. He kind of teases his interest um, publicly on the World Day of Peace, which is the first day of 1980. Um, he cites conversations with scientists about nuclear questions, and that's our friends at the Pontifical Academy that he's talking about. Um, he then gives a speech uh, at the U United Nations uh, Education, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. Um, this is kind of a wide-ranging speech, and Weisskopf has written in his correspondence that he actually was quite frustrated by it. Um, he thought that the nuclear issue was not engaged thoroughly enough, that his statements were too vague. And he noted that he saw in the American press that that was not the thing that the press thought was significant enough to write about. It was, it was barely covered. Um, and so he's sort of pushing more and more for the Pope to get involved on this. The Pope then visits Hiroshima and Nagasaki, makes a few statements there, nothing really groundbreaking, but the biggest um, Next move is uh, October 81. There's a working group of the Pontifical Academy um, where they discuss, uh, they 
draft and discuss a statement on uh, the consequences of nuclear war, which largely include the medical consequences and the agricultural consequences. It's not really talking about if a nuclear bomb ha explodes, you know, here's the scientific, here's what happens, here's the radioactive fallout, but literally how many people would die if a bomb was detonated over New York City and how many doctors would die so that they couldn't treat the people who lived, etc. Um, and the Pope is really moved by this. He then sends delegations of his scientists to leaders of different uh, nuclear powers. So he sends them to the United States, the USSR, the United Nations, um, England, and France. They also planned delegations to China and India that actually didn't happen. Um, and Vice Pope is one of those that is sent to Reagan. Reagan received his acclamations <coughs> fairly coldly, uh, probably because he was sort of interested in reinvigorating the Cold War as a concept for his political aims. And he was also at the time uh, thinking about expanding the arsenal, so it was sort of tense in the room. Um, but this was cut a little bit by one of the scientists, Howard Hyatt of the Harvard Public Health School, who talked about the attempt on Reagan's life the year prior and explained that Reagan, you know, he was saved by the doctors at these DC hospitals, but that, that likely he would not have survived had the hospital been overwhelmed by uh, victims of a nuclear attack. Uh, and so Reagan takes this in and he actually then quotes the book of Revelation, which is the book from the Bible that talks about uh, Armageddon and Apocalypse. So again, coming back to this narrative of nuclear war being, uh, being a holy war. Uh, Brezhnev, in, in his receipt of his uh, scientists, also quoted, um, he quoted the Orthodox Church, and that's emblematic of how the Soviet Union is shifting in its approach to religion, and it also, again, is talking, it's really driving home this um, religious conflict. And then finally, um, the, the real change-making point in um, Vatican policy is the Pope's UN address in 1982, um, in which he says that deterrence is an acceptable, a morally acceptable intermediate step on the path to disarmament. So um, he then he does importantly couch this in um, that it's it's acceptable in this day and age, and he does not explain what conditions would have to change for it to no longer be acceptable. Um, but he's saying, you know, that this is okay in the eyes of God to maintain these weapons for this mutually assured destruction wrought stability. Um, and that's something that gets taken up by the American bishops um, the following year. They publish a pastoral letter, which is 150 pages long and gets excerpted in the New York Times, so it's um, fairly well understood in the American context. Um, it's saying about the same thing, that deterrence is acceptable, though it's not going to bring lasting peace, uh, though they do understand also that they're going to re have to reassess, and that's what happens five mm -hmm. years later um, when Reagan introduces the Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI. Um, this is an idea that he has to create a missile defense system that is both ground and space-based. It's not entirely clear exactly how it was supposed to work, but it would have lasers, particle beam weapons, and high-powered computing. Um, and the concern was, one, would it work? Um, but more importantly, uh, as with all missile defense systems, the concern is that it destabilizes mutually assured dis destruction um, by changing the uh, incentive on first use. And, you know, if, if, if I can protect my cities, why would I not strike first, um, et cetera. So they can come out and sort of condemn SDI, but they do not say that it changes the Catholic calculus on deterrence, that, that it doesn't um, make it unacceptable. Uh, and interestingly, the Pontifical Academy also came out against SDI, or they, they published or they, they wrote something critical of SDI, but they actually were not able to publish it. Um, that the Pope sort of killed it on the United States' request. Um, the United States had actually sought the Pope's explicit endorsement of SDI, but because of the trepidations by the scientists, he declined to give that as well. Um, but we're seeing here again that the Vatican's uh, public uh, kind of perception as being apolitical is, is a falsity, um, and that clearly it's, it's not wanting to do anything that undermines the United States' position. Um, and then after this, it sort of stays stable for a really long time throughout the end of the Cold War um, and, and the early post-Cold War era. Um, this is the official doctrine of the, United, of the Catholic Church, that um, deterrence is acceptable. It's acceptable to maintain a nuclear arsenal so long as you're not using it. Um, and this changes only under Francis. Uh, so Francis uh, becomes Pope in 2013. And in 2019, much like John Paul II, he made a trip to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
And there, at a press conference, he stated that it is not only the use, but also the possession of nuclear weapons that is immoral, and so immoral that it ought to be added to the Catholic Catechism. Uh, and, and with that, you have the closure of this era of um, Catholic-endorsed deterrence policy. Uh, it's not entirely clear what Francis saw as having changed, what circumstances um, an era he now saw as over that, that his predecessors had not. Um, but that's sort of the end of that, and, and the Pontifical Academy has come out as recently as this year talking about um, the threat of nuclear war in Ukraine um, and, and their concerns about that, but now they can't rely on this idea of deterrence as, as a stabilizing factor. Um, and, and so this is really how we get here. It's, it's difficult for me, um, I have access to the scientific documents, but not the, you know, the thoughts of the popes. And so I don't quite understand why they think what they do about deterrence and why they think that it's acceptable at some points and not now. Um, but this is where we got to. This is where we are. So that's all I've got. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Abigail. It, it is always fascinating when when the, the Pope or, or <clears throat> people start to speak about the legality and morality of uh, deterrence or of the use, the, the eventual use of nuclear weapons. So it's, uh, it's quite a big issue and has gone through all the Cold War, most probably. But we will come back to, to your topic. Uh, after we have listened to our last, but not least, speaker, who is David Irashek from the Masaryk University in Brno, Czech Republic. He's also a PhD student. And his topic is cooperation of Warsaw Pact military intelligence from Czechoslovakia's perspective. Czechoslovakia, my goodness, we have quite forgotten about it. <laughs> Please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests. Uh, my topic comes from my uh, dissertation and uh, it has the roots in the interest of uh, intelligence studies. Uh, so the paper is about the cooperation of Warsaw Pact uh, military intelligence from Czechoslovakia's perspective. This next slide. Uh, briefly, I will tell you something at the beginning, then we can talk about the methodology. And uh, because I'm not sure if everybody is, uh, here is uh, familiar with the intelligence and the military intelligence especially, I will give you the definition, especially valid during the Cold War in Czechoslovakia. Uh, then there will be brief uh, def uh, this, uh, this definition of role and function of uh, Czechoslovakia military intelligence within Czechoslovak armed forces and uh, the history about, about it, just to, to know what's going on. And then the, the, the last part of the presentation is about the mechanisms of uh, cooperation and levels of cooperation, which is, the, uh, which is the central part of my presentation. So, Czechoslovak military intelligence named Spravodajská zpráva generálního štábu during Cold War era fulfilled tasks for the high command of Czechoslovak People's Army and its leadership in power represented by Czechoslovak Communist Party. Also, it provided valuable information to the other military intelligence services of Warsaw Pact countries, particularly Soviet Union military intelligence, GRU. Similar tasks fulfilled each other military intelligence in every Warsaw Pact country, and there was some cooperation between them. But what kind of cooperation? This is the topic I would like to discuss. Uh, we have two uh, research questions. Uh, what kind of cooperation existed between the military intelligence of Warsaw Pact armies and which mechanisms did they use for this cooperation. So uh, research is done from the Czechoslovak military uh, intelligence perspective and is framed by the period of 1955 to 1989, which means the, big, the creation of the Warsaw Pact and the fall of communism. Uh, also, uh, it's focused only on the military intelligence service with outer responsibilities, so the counterintelligence is excluded from this, uh, this uh, research. Uh, partly because it would widen the team too much, and also, and maybe it was, it, it's more important, in Czechoslovakia in that time, uh, counterintelligence, military counterintelligence was a part of the Ministry of Interior, not the Ministry of Defense. Uh, so mo most of the sources comes, uh, fro come from the uh, Czech archives. Uh, 
which keep documents from the intelligence and security apparatus of communist Czechoslovakia and were recently declassified. Uh, primarily used metal for research as a content analysis of those documents. Another use is the oral history method. Uh, I was questioning the former high uh, level uh, military intelligence officers. Please, text slide. For the methodology, I used uh, that one, which covers Sherman Kent and later Mark Leventhal. Uh, the, both of them, uh, they understand intelligence uh, as a process, product, and institution. What does it mean? Process, uh, that, that's the gaining of the information. Product, so those are the reports they, they, they can, they can, uh, they can write. And institution, this is the, it's the institution itself, the military intelligence service. Next slide. From many definitions of military intelligence, uh, this research uses the one in effect during the Cold War, and you can read it. Uh, just briefly, uh, military intelligence involves political, military, economic, and science and technology areas of probable enemies uh, in order to research their military capabilities and political and strategic intentions. At war, military intelligence uh, covers also information in direct relationship uh, with, with warring. Next. And here in this chart, uh, I can describe you the role and function and position of the of the military intelligence. Uh, so it was in direct uh, direct uh, command of Czech general staff of Czechoslovak armed forces, and uh, it has uh, it had uh, two subordinate uh, authorities, intelligence authorities and reconnaissance authorities. But uh, of course, there was always some kind of relationship with uh, Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and Ministry of uh, Foreign Trade, for example, to uh, cover the uh, real function of the military intelligence officers abroad. And on the other side of the chart, you can see the, uh, the, the part of the cooperation from the Warsaw Pact, uh, joint military forces, and the military intelligence of uh, each particular uh, Warsaw Pact country. What about just brief uh, description of the structure of military intelligence? Uh, so, in charge of uh, Czechoslovak military intelligence stood the chief of military intelligence. He had several deputies, political deputy, deputy responsible for subordinated radio, electronic, and army reconnaissance units, deputy responsible for secret network and secret agents, deputy responsible for research and development, and deputy responsible for collection and analysis of info in, uh, intelligence information. Next slide. So, brief history, of course, it's a long period of time, so I uh, pick up only four dates. After the communist uprising in February 1948, the military intelligence of Czechoslovakia went through personal changes, which led to the almost complete replacement of its personnel. Under increasing the Soviet influence of, on armed forces in the early 1950s, military intelligence was rebelled under the close supervision of Soviet advisors. After creating the Warsaw Pact in 1955, Soviet interests were advanced by other institutions and organs, partly from joint military staff organs of the, uh, on, of the Warsaw Pact, partly due to liaison officers as assigned to the Czechoslovak military intelligence. Due to Soviet occupation in August 1968 and the positioning of the Soviet armed forces in the Czechoslovak territory after this event, Soviet influence naturally grew up also in the domain of military intelligence. On the picture, you, uh, on the chart, you can you can see, you can see the uh, the pictures of the product of uh, military intelligence. Some of the products. Thank you. And here uh, you have the you have the table of the of uh, my uh, my research. On the left column, you can see the uh, the levels of cooperation, which I divided into the bilateral cooperation and the multilateral or let's say coalition, because we are talking about the Warsaw Pact uh, coalition. On the right, uh, through these levels, uh, went uh, went all the old mechanisms of cooperation, which are on the right side. So those were the Soviet advisors, liaison officers, annual conferences, education, exchange of information, and military training. And now we will discuss uh, some of the uh, the levels, uh, some of the mechanisms and levels uh, more uh, more deeply. So multilateral cooperation. Multilateral cooperation between Warsaw Pact organs had the character of exchanging information in multiple military intelligence domains. 
significant event happened in 1964 during the meeting of Warsaw Pact intelligent representatives in Bulgaria. In the form of the SOFIA protocol, it established the annual military intelligence conference or sessions. It concerns the coordination of activities and the cooperation of military intelligence. Since then, an annual military intelligence session has been held every year, organized on rotational principle and went on in one capital city of the Soviet bloc per year. It was internally divided into sections, which occupied different topics like intelligence gathering by the human intelligence or the signal radioelectronic intelligence. This kind of cooperation covered strategic as well as operational levels. Every country responsible for the organization of the conference had an obligation to send the program and main topics prior to the conference to the others. On the picture, uh, you can see so those, those are those comes from the from the those conferences of military intelligence representatives. Uh, there have been some form of multinational cooperation even before and uh, before prior 1964. Uh, Mil Czechoslovak military intelligence established col collaboration with other Warsaw Pact armies to pass on an indication of an unexpected attack in 1961. It was probably due to the uh, Second Berlin Crisis. In 1969, after the military intelligence session in Budapest, was signed agreement of collaboration of Warsaw Pact strategic intelligence in a tense or during the crisis. This document admits that the system of collaboration between Warsaw Pact military intelligence created during the main international crisis in 1960s only partially responded to security needs. It could register and evaluate, but was not fit to make some predictions. Warsaw Pact military intelligence has to make a collective agreement about an unanimous understanding of increasing international tension, signs and symptoms. Approved measures should cover legal and illegal espionage, radio technical intelligence, and intelligence analysis. Approved protocols uh, among Warsaw Pact military intelligence had a wide range of topics, but they lacked instructions for different stages of crisis. It was the reason why they, uh, they, they, they had made uh, some new agreement. By the way, on the picture, left picture, uh, look at, uh, pay attention to the last uh, man on the left, last two men. The first one is the, uh, is the director of the Czechoslovak military intelligence, and the man in the head should be the director of the Hungarian military intelligence in 1980s. Please. Yep. And uh, just an example uh, from uh, information, uh, information sharing uh, of, from the Czechoslovak military intelligence perspective uh, from the year 1977 to 1978. Uh, it shows considerable disproportion between intelligence information gained by Czechoslovak military intelligence from East Germany, Hungarian, Poland, and Bulgarian military intelligence, and vice versa compared to intelligence sharing with Soviet, uh, Soviet military intelligence. So uh, I highlighted two, two numbers on the left. Uh, you can see that the Czechoslovak military intelligence received uh, in this period of time more than 100 uh, intelligence reports from East Germany, which makes sense because uh, the main uh, the main enemy for the Czechoslovak army was the West Germany uh, army, West German army, and uh, East Germany were able to uh, to understand pretty well. Uh, in compare with this, uh, look at the more than 500 uh, reports which Czechoslovak military intelligence service uh, sent to the Soviet Union, but received only 28 reports. So there was there's a high uh, disproportion about it. And uh, the second uh, main part is about the uh, bilateral cooperation. No, we have pro proof of bilateral cooperation of Czechoslovak military intelligence with Soviet, East Germany, Poland, and Hungarian military intelligence counterparts, but cooperation with other remaining Warsaw Pact armies is, is expected. Specifically, bilater specifically bilater bilateral cooperation between Czechoslovak and Poland military intelligence organs, expressed in the form of the bilateral agreement signed in 1976, relates to the domain of signal intelligence and seems quite profound. This agreement determined that in Czechoslovakia, uh, near Bratislava, there would be a radio transmitter working for Poland military intelligence service. On the contrary, in favor of uh, Czechoslovak military intelligence, worked radio transmitter in the village Doluje near Štětín, town in Poland. Uh, similar agreements had to exist also with Hungarian military intelligence, because uh, 
I find out that the Hungarian Electronic Reconnaissance Unit members were even presented on Czechoslovak territory as a part of Signal Intelligence Unit in the western part of the Czechoslovakia. In the 1980s, we have proof of deepening of joint military training between the Soviet Spetsnaz unit located on the Czechoslovak territory uh, with its Czechoslovak counterpart from the 22nd Airborne Regiment. Uh, this is the picture on the left. So there are the special forces troops uh, doing uh, the it's, it's training, field training. Concerning this is, is a signed agreement between Czechoslovak and Poland military intelligence from 1989 concerning the domain of special long-range reconnaissance units, their joint annual training and consultations over their weapons and equip equipment. We've already spoken about bilateral cooperation with Soviet GRU, uh, about their advisors, liaison officers, uh, representatives of Soviet GRU assigned by uh, Czechoslovak military intelligence. From memories of one uh, high-ranking military intelligence member uh, to the events from 1980s, the liaison officer of uh, GRU was interested in, in most of the intelligence information produced by Czechoslovaks at this time. He literally said he took everything. After 1968, the Soviet Central Group of Forces was presented on the Czechoslovak territory and we have proof of specific position of Soviet, uh, Soviet Secret Service. Due to the presence and closeness, closeness of Soviet troops, there were suddenly perfect possibilities for new kind of cooperation on the, all the level, tactical, operational and strategic level. So as the conclusion, uh, between military intelligence of Warsaw Pact armies existed two forms of cooperation uh, expressed by multinational cooperation on the level of Warsaw Pact uh, organs and bilateral, bilateral cooperation in specific military intelligence topics between two countries. Uh, through it went mechanisms of cooperation represented, represented at the beginning as the, uh, as the Soviet advisors and after 1950s uh, as a liaison officers, organization of annual military intelligence conferences, education in Soviet military installations, uh, exchange of information in the different domains and by common military training. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the attention. And thank you very much. It was a very interesting topic. We do not hear much about this, but I remember that around uh, that at around the regime changes in Hungary, there was a, a saying. Some people said that uh, why regime changes could go so relatively smoothly here in this region. One of the region, one of the reasons was that the military and the intelligence of each and every country did have good and working relations. So I don't know if it's true. I am not a historian of this period. But, uh, but you seem to confirm this uh, saying. This saying. OK, ladies and gentlemen, we have listened to four very interesting topics. And now the floor is open to you to ask questions. We have, uh, we have 20 minutes uh, to have questions, uh, to ask questions, to make remarks if you want to. And uh, the panel is at your disposal to answer all of these. So who would, yes, please, you, and then in the back. Can I have a question for the three Please speak up. Yes, uh, thank you for your talk. I like it very much. So you're telling the story of cont continuity from anti-fascism and anti-communism. But I assume that there were also many communists amongst the anti-fascists. And so did the U.S. also cooperate with them, and how did they deal? So how, how, how worked it out with them? Because they were the new enemies. But these networks used as intelligence material or the new anti-communists also use their former contacts with the new, com uh, with the new communists to, to, get a, to get, gain an advantage. So do you also look at this, this group of anti-fascists? Julia? Um, thank you very much for the question. Uh, it also gives me the chance to deepen a little bit more the history of the cooperation between American secret services and Italian resistance more in general. Uh, as I mentioned, um, we have to distinguish between the Italian anti-fascist anti community that was in the US and the broader, of course, Italian anti-fascist community. Uh, as I said, in the US, the number of Italian communists was really low 
because many uh, anti-fascists with communist sympathies um, actually went in exile in the Soviet Union. So there's a sort of uh, separation, uh, even at that time, uh, in the choice of the country where to find refuge. Uh, the situation is different uh, during the Italian campaign in Italy, where the number of communist anti-fascists is, is really big. Actually, it's maybe, uh, maybe it's the biggest, like considering the, uh, the totality of uh, the anti-fascist strength in the partisan groups. Um, and this, is, uh, this has been uh, a long debated topic in the history of Italian resistance and in the history of the relations between Italian resistance and the Allies, and actually, I have to say, the Anglo-Americans. Um, because it was argued, uh, there's a debate about uh, if the Anglo-Americans made preferences in terms of which kind of Italian anti-fascists helping and who not, like to, if they excluded the communists um, from their aiding uh, and helping the Italian resistance, the resistance or not. And actually, the last uh, basically agreed uh, idea is that during the war, even if they were pretty much worried about the future outcome of the communist strength in Italy, uh, this didn't mean that they made many differences. Uh, they try to give help um, in terms of, as I said, funding, equipment, uh, but not political reconnaissance, uh, not to the ones who had closest political ideas, but to the ones who could achieve their goal better. Like, if a communist partisan group uh, it will most likely achieve successes in sabotage operations, guerrilla operations, the Allies would have had them. Uh, the Anglo-Americans would have sent money and equipment without making distinctions. So these two souls live together, the fear for the future. Uh, and as we go closest to the end of the world, it is even more felt. And the fact that there was a common enemy and communists could not be ignored because they were part of this struggle. So it's interesting. And the the. The contrast between cooperating with the communists or not it was much more felt in the Italian anti-fascist communities in the US, where, where this became a, a really reason of uh, fight within the Italian anti-fascist community itself than in, on the Italian territory where the communists were much more strong. Thank you, Julia. In the back, awesome. yes, Thank I'm you. coming to you. Please. Uh, these are all four really interesting talks. I have questions for a few different panels, if that's OK. So the first is for David with Pike. Um, it's good to see you. Uh, I'm Philip. Um, and so I'm curious if you saw any materials on how they thought about mechanisms of counterintelligence. So one of the big problems, right, if you share with a lot of other countries is that their leaks in other countries then compromise what you collected. So I suspect the reason that there was a lot more transmission to the Soviets than vice versa is because the Soviets knew that we, being the United States, had compromised Warsaw Pact military intelligence pretty heavily at that point. So I'm curious from the Czech perspective uh, how they thought about counterintelligence and what they shared and didn't share. Uh, and then the second question for, for Abigail. Um, I'm curious, and the answer is probably no, because I don't know how much was declassified at the time. Uh, if the Pope ever acknowledged the contradiction between the yes and bellow principles and, and MAD, and specifically, uh, you would think that the Pope would actually like Reagan's strategy of trying to escape MAD, uh, because one of the reasons the United States moved towards a counterforce strategy of trying to deny the other side the retaliatory ability is because a, a counter value strategy that Matt is premised on, as you know, for the context of everybody else, uh, is based on destroying cities and population centers. Uh, the, the law of armed conflict, which is derived from, from Gus and Bello, uh, says you can't do because you have to differentiate between combatants and non combatants. So I'm curious if there is ever any discussion that, in fact, a more assertive nuclear strategy with more weapons was more in line with the church's own just war doctrine, uh, or if those, maybe, maybe those strategic discussions were too classified. Uh, or to archaic to spill over into the, the, the agency. Thank you. Uh, David? And yes, so just let me clarify, you are interested in, about the Czechoslovak position for the intelligence sharing uh, of the information, right? Yeah, and how they thought about the counterintelligence, the risk that if they share it to the other sides, it might be leaked by uh, a CIA or MI6, etc. Yeah. Uh, Maybe I should clarify the position of military intelligence uh, in the Czechoslovak uh, system or the security system. Uh, even it was uh, under the military cover, 
and it was, uh, let's say, uh, independent uh, military service. It was always uh, under the surveillance of counterintelligence, military counterintelligence, which uh, I have said it was uh, part of the uh, Ministry of Interior. So uh, the, the guy who, they, the military intelligence just uh, find out some information, proceed it, and send it to the, to the Russians or to the others. But the, the covering uh, or the questions like, oh, maybe the, 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 the other side could, could uh, reach it. It was part of the responsibilities for the uh, counterintelligence, which, which was under the Ministry of Interior and not the business of the, of the military of the army. Okay, thank you. Abigail? Sure, so, so your question was about whether uh, whether the Pope was actually sort of interested in the SCI idea uh, behind the scenes, but but not willing to like mention it outright because it was in conflict with... Uh... Do, you want, do you want to repeat your question once yeah, more? Sorry. So the, the SCI is being part of actually a much larger uh, U.S. nuclear strategy to, to try to escape that. The U.S. Uh, constantly and still to this day tries to does not accept MAD uh, as a condition, uh, and its policy is in fact to prevent the other side from being able to retaliate, uh, and its policy partly because of, of legal constraints and uniform post military justice derived from uh, Justin Bellow and, and just war theory is not to, is to discriminate and try and intentionally hit only military targets, in particular uh, and the enemy's nuclear weapons. That requires uh, first and foremost moving away from disarmament to having a, a greater number of, of nuclear weapons and higher quality. And then SDI mops up what's left after we've hit those weapons, right? So it's, it's interesting to me that the, the Pope's starting assumptions actually favor a much more, if, if they're willing to accept deterrence at all, uh, would suggest a much more assertive nuclear strategy in line with Reagan rather than MAD uh, alone, which seems inconsistent, and especially that is a, a move toward disarmament. Right. Um, so I, I can't speak to, you know, I, I don't have written correspondence to this at all, but it's sort of educated speculation. Um, but Part of the issue is that the, the Vatican isn't taking a, a stand openly in support of the United States. Um, so it can't really, it, it's really uh, reliant on that uh, for stability purposes. And that's what his scientists are telling him. And, and that's the advice that he's taking. Um, privately, might he support it? It's very possible. Um, but from a public perspective, uh, this is the form of stability that he uh, feels as reliable, at least for the time being, um, and and giving either side sort of a competitive edge is in conflict with uh, his vision for how, how to avoid nuclear war. Um, so I would say that I think most importantly, he's listening to his scientists. Um, and whether or not he might believe that strategically it makes sense for the United States to pursue whatever initiative it chooses to escape MAD. Um, his scientists are not in agreement about that. Um, his scientists are much more concerned, um, being people who've worked on atomic weaponry, um, are much more concerned about the consequence of nuclear war, regardless of the winner. Um, and, and so that's the people that he's really listening to. Um, and I, I think that's obvious in the way that he defers to them on issues of scientific fact uh, and, and takes, it's interesting that he takes uh, the question of stability and how it's wrought by MAD as a form of scientific fact on par with here's how a fission bomb works. Um, but so I would say I don't have actual correspondence to this effect. I believe he probably would have been sympathetic to the American position. Um, and, I, and we know that he is to some extent in that he quashes the written work by the, the academicians. Um, but he also trusts them and their assessment on stability. OK, thank you. Oh. <laughs> that you mean to. Very good. You were the next one. Please, um, the lady in the middle, yes. My question is also for Abigail and maybe just more educated. Speak speakers. up, please, because this is okay. going. My question is also for Abigail, um, and maybe it's just educated speculation for this one too, but I would be curious to know what, like, the Pope's position on nuclear deterrence, how that was received in a place like Poland, where the Catholic Church had huge influence in society, but. You know, obviously they were on the other side of the Iron Curtain at this, you know, and really on the other side of the position for that the coach took. 
Right. I mean, if you want to talk about the perspective of Poland, um, I would love to. Uh, uh, but it's it's complicated in, in who you're asking about in the early 1980s, right? Like the the Polish establishment, the state, is spying on the Pope actively uh, through their uh, secret police um, and their deployments of informants in, in the Vatican. And so they're not really excited at any of this. Um, but the burgeoning solidarity movement is, is really heartened by him and his visit back home. Um, and, and a lot of those people uh, are unwilling to really question anything that, that this man says because, I mean, he would later become sainted and, and has this hugely venerated place in Polish society. And that's really developing then. You have atheists going to church because, you know, it's headed by a Polish man now. Um, and so I would say there's a real divide in Poland, and, and I think that's, you know, that's obviously going to come to more importance by, by the end of the decade, um, but I would say that it seems like the, the state remains loyal to its allies in Moscow and, and, you know, would continue to be kind of worried about um, the Pope's entrance into the debate, but at the same time, um, you know, we did have a, a delegation to Brezhnev, he accepted them warmly. Um, there's a willingness to engage in this dialogue because it's seen as not quite so geopolitically charged, um, because it's purely about technology. May I add just one thing? Uh, most of you were not yet living at the time, but we did, some of us. And I have to tell you that nuclear issues was not very high on the public agenda. They were not discussed in the papers, they were not talking about. Uh, but except, obviously, at the earlier periods in the Cold, Cold War. But even, uh, even uh, we did some study on, uh, on the hottest moment of the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, that was nuclear related. But at the time, uh, press freedom was unheard of. So, for example, here in Hungary, and I've checked all the papers at the time, no one has heard anything about that, except that all oh, those imperialists, they have put uh, uh, the friendly, pe the brotherly peoples of Cuba under this, uh, you know, this kind of thing. So uh, it was not very much in, on the public's mind. This is why it is one more thing, why it is one more issue, why it is more difficult to do research. I'm sorry for this interruption, but I had to do it. Uh, you were the next, and you have been paid. <clears throat> so yes. uh, just a question to Abigail made a remark, but um, so you were talking about how Pope Francis changed his perspective on, on nuclear weapons and even deterrence being unacceptable. And, and is it possible that this is partly because the church has lost a lot of influence over the last decades, so the number of people in the Western world or developed countries have become more and more irreligious. Thus, uh, I think we can kind of observe a, a, a stronger re rhetorical shift on, on part of Pope Francis. Uh, some label it as progressive, but of course on the action side it's a bit uh, lackluster, I would say. Um, so could it be that in the bipolar world, uh, deter like uh, the complete um, uh, abolishment of nuclear weapons was an absurd idea that, wouldn't, that the church wouldn't even float. But now, in a multipolar world, it's uh, it's more of an acceptable idea, and although still irrealistic in terms of uh, larger nuclear powers, but it could be like a, an advantageous rhetorical element that would show that the Pope is more progressive than its predecessors. Sure. I mean, I always think that it's sort of difficult to frame any kind of theological argument um, by a religious leader as it's it's a hope it's like trying to maintain or, or gain following although sometimes that has certainly been the case I would say that it probably was with Vatican II an attempt to kind of maintain a following base um, in the challenges of modernity and I think that that's probably more likely something you can say about the appointment of Francis specifically I would hesitate to say that he's calculating in his remarks in office but I would say that his election um, did have something to do with that. It's sort of the idea that we can challenge um, like the new leftist agenda by putting in a liberation theologist as pope um, and, and co-opting those ideas, those progressive ideas for the church's own purposes. Um, so I, you know, I would hesitate to say that it has anything to do with uh, kind of strategy on the part of, of Francis, um, but I, I do think that it probably, the church makes these kinds of, it, it takes this into account when they elect new popes. Um, I, I do also think it was strategic to elect a Polish pope at, at the center of the Cold War, or 
late years of the Cold War. Um, and I also think that you're probably right about the multipolar calculus. I think that in the same sense that it, the nuclear issue was not quite as much on people's minds by the 80s as it was in the 50s, um, I also think it was probably less front and center in 2019. Now, perhaps there's a resurgence, but I think that it's easier for him to make this statement of it is immoral to even possess nuclear weapons uh, than it would have been when it felt like not having nuclear weapons meant being wiped off the face of the map. Uh, also, another remark, if I may, just for, very, uh, for Aaron. Very fast, because others are waiting. Oh, just a, it's a question for Aaron. Uh, okay. So it was very interesting uh, that you mentioned how different scientific groups, uh, citizen groups, are were trying to influence the, the relations were between science and policy and, and, uh, and the society. So, and you said, like, it wasn't until the 70s that the non-proliferation movement was really strengthened. But what do you think about the baby tooth survey? And uh, and how and its effect, which was of course a citizen initiative, but also backed up by sciences. There were surveys carried out, and it had a tremendous impact on the anti-nuclear movement. And well, it was it was published in 1961. These mm -hmm. the preliminary reports, mm -hmm. and by 63 they signed the Partial Nuclear Testament Treaty. Mm -hmm. So if you could reflect on that, and just perhaps a note that it would be it might be interesting to compare these these issues with the Soviet Union and how scientists there. Um, uh, perceived, for example, uh, the science policy government in the face. Thank you for your question. Um, the my dissertation is a comparative study, so I'm looking at Slovakia. I'm looking right. I'm not looking at the, at Russia. I'm decentering it, so I have a different sort of calculus of who I'm going to be concerned about. But that's absolutely what I'm looking at. I think the most interesting thing about the baby tooth study, and then there were a couple other um, things about like the Japanese fishermen from atomic testing and the radiation that comes from from these um, early uh, testing and sickness and, you know, from radiation. Uh, the most fascinating thing about it is the lack of continuity between when it happens in 61 and then, like, the information as it's transferred, the scientific information about this. I don't know if, if everybody knows what the baby tooth study is. Um, no? Okay. So the baby tooth study was this longitudinal study that was done um, in order to uh, trace traces of radiation that from atomic testing in children's teeth. Right, so like when your tooth falls out, right? So they they traced this over a series of years, and what they found was that children in I forget when it was published was it 1961? Yeah, was it okay? Early. So right around there, right? So um, they found that they that children who were born today had significant amounts of particular forms of radiation in their teeth, right? That nobody had before, and so this was publicized these results. But the thing that was very interesting to me, especially in the U.S., was that it led to like small movements against nuclear testing, but there was no direct line, and that's what. What's so odd to me about the science is that it's not that that's where the science communication element comes in because it's no clear cut kind of solution where you have like this information about like radiation in your children's teeth and then it becomes public knowledge and then the public is like all unified against atomic testing, right? Like that just does not happen at all. So it really reflects sort of how complicated this dissemination of information is and how it's 100% filtered through the people who are receiving it. So um, one of the things I thought was just to wrap up the comment about that is that you know, in Europe, we have much more of, of a, right, the, the, um, the Committee for Nuclear Disarmament, right, we have all of that happening earlier than we do in the United States. And so one of the reasons why I framed my project in the way that I did was to look at that, to look at what the differences behind these, um, these differences, right, and these different trajectories that they do and the way that they react to what we would imagine would be the same research, right, like the same scientific information. Good. Okay. Yeah, Thanks good. for the question. Although I have to remark that uh, scientists have tried to do, uh, have tried to find solutions even before, even before the bomb was dropped down on Hiroshima, the scientists were discussing it in the Manhattan Project if it should be used or if it shouldn't. Of so, course. Of course. Yes. Yeah. So they <laughs> were there. Then there is the Pugwash movement. I was waiting for you to mention the Pugwash movement, and so on. So. Um, there has been science, but as you said in your last sentence, this just, this just didn't go through to the public. 
So somehow they were isolated or <laughs> I think and, and Pogwash and those international conferences is really not what this particular, you know, like the idea for this particular chapter is to demonstrate sort of how scientists themselves became public figures during the Cold War, which was mm -hmm. very different. And the freedom that they engaged with in the United States, which I will be very interested to see how that relates to other places. You know, like mm -hmm. when, when I'm looking in other countries to see if that kind of um, elevation of scientists mm -hmm. as public figures becomes um, similar, right, in that way. So I think that, that, right, that was really the major, I think, the major angle for that. An interesting story how Teller becomes from a total outcast, no one speaks right. about him here in Hungary, and then he, at the end, it was in the 80s or 70s that he's invited on the television to talk, and uh, sorry, I don't watch so it. debating with Neumann, so there was this yeah, debate. Yeah, Neumann, that's the debate Neumann. that I was yeah. meant, yeah, like casually Sorry, but we yes. still have some questions, <laughs> and we have five minutes, so who are the ones who want? Yes, oh, three, sorry. One, two, three. The lady was first, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, my question is for David. I, I, I've been taught by Daniela Rikharova, and she does obviously a lot on Czechoslovakian counterterrorism measures and a lot about intelligence studies. And my question is kind of two part. I'm wondering what the relationship was between the military intelligence realms of Czechoslovakia and the, the Yugoslav republics. Is that something that you didn't really touch on? If there mm -hmm. was any? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the other uh, angle to the question is what was the relationship, if any, between military intelligence and Czechoslovakia's kind of acceptance or slash harboring of terrorists, especially in Latin America. Um, and uh, anti-terrorism? Uh, so there was, there was obviously like individuals like Carlos Jackal, who was oh, okay. against Czechoslovakia, and I'm wondering if there was any relationship mm -hmm. to those individuals in military intelligence. Yeah. So uh, first of all, about the Yugoslavian uh, military intelligence, uh, it's very interesting because after uh, at the end of the 1940s, the, the Yugoslavia was excluded from the from the Soviet uh, or from the Eastern Bloc, and uh, almost uh, mo all all the time until the 1989, uh, the military intelligence uh, was partially focusing on the Yugoslavia, not as the enemy but uh, as suspicious environment. And what uh, what I have uh, received uh, from the some uh, intelligence officers. They used this country as a, as a communication hub. So when there was somebody in the Germany, who, uh, some agent in the Germany. He traveled to, to Yugoslavia, and uh, the Czechoslovak agents uh, met him over there to discuss the topic or to receive the information. So uh, I think this this is the answer. The other one, uh, it was it was more the. Uh, Political secret police who was responsible for uh, all the topics uh, like Latin American uh, events. Okay, it was not not a, the military intelligence has of course some military attache, attaches, but the closest one was uh, in Cuba, and uh, he was uh, it was a uh, allied country, and uh, they didn't uh, or of, at least officially they didn't uh, make any any uh, intelligence. Uh, offensive intelligence over there. Thank you. Then we have two more questions, and I close the list. The gentleman here, yeah, uh, because so we are running into coffee break, so mm -hmm. please. One for uh, Abigail, one for David. So I was curious, Abigail, if, um, and I'm sorry I missed the beginning of your paper, but if you had a chance to look at the archives of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, because when I, it was years ago, but when I did research on the history of uh, birth control, they had more contemporary records, and the Catholic bishops were quite active on nuclear issues like in the 1980s. And so sometimes you get the correspondence of between the American Catholic bishops in Rome. And, and also, some of the uh, anti nuclear activists, like the Berger brothers, I think some of their papers are available. But maybe you've already been there and done that. But I'd be interested. To right. No, I, I didn't get down to, okay. to see those ones. I was at the archives at MIT looking at the Weisskopf papers, right. and there are some correspondences between him and uh, Catholic bishops yeah. in the United States. And I, I was interested in that question, and I, of course, touch on it at the end. Right. Um, but my bigger question was Rome itself. Uh, and so perhaps that would be the next step to see those correspondences between the U.S. and Rome. But I, I was less interested in, in the question of what you know bishops in the United States were saying versus what... Yeah. But sometimes um, they have insights about what happening in Rome. Right, right, and that's, yeah. you know, that would be interesting, but I, I didn't get to it yet. Okay, thank you. 
And then, David, I was really struck by the information you have about the number of military intelligence reports from mm -hmm. different you know, uh, countries. And like, it's so striking that there were more than 500 and from the uh, Soviet Union. <coughs> I'm wondering what we make of that. Like, uh, first of all, like, were you able to get a more or less complete inventory of reports so that you can be confident? Or, uh, no, no, no. You know, yeah, that, that is, of course, the point. It was just one, one particular year, 1977-78. Yeah. Uh, and are all those reports like available to read? No. Oh. No, no, no. It was uh, <laughs> so it's accident. Like the metadata, I it's found like it. the, the, maybe their titles or something. Yeah, yeah, it was just just uh, some annual report oh, okay. uh, where I found it, right. and. Uh, I think there was also some uh, some information sharing in in the in the staff, uh, but on the level of the Warsaw Pact uh, uh, general staff. Uh, but uh, this, from the Czechoslovak perspective, there is high inequality. Right. I mean, just uh, I'd be curious to know, and maybe you are too, about like, is it that you know Moscow is kind of like giving the party line, like a lot of the military intelligence they're providing is a way of like kind of communicating to the rest of the Warsaw Pact, like kind of what Moscow believes, or is it actually like, well, who knows, right? I mean, yeah. at this point, maybe it's hard to know. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. There was one last question. Yes, please. Yeah, I'll keep it very brief, but this is a Thank question you. for Abigail. I was curious, because um, you mentioned that you weren't entirely sure like what has changed between Pope John Paul II and Pope Francis. So I was wondering if you found anything on Benedict, because obviously he's not only more a conservative pope like in the model of Pope John Paul, but also he's operating in the post Cold War context like Pope Francis. Yeah. Um, I didn't like pay particular attention to Benedict uh, in this context because he didn't say anything relevant. Um, but I, you know, I'm familiar with him um, ideologically, and I think that you know Benedict, he's still around. You could ask him if, if somebody you know sees, knows his number. Um, but I, I have the impression that he was you know fairly much more conservative. I think he could be considered in, in the tradition of John Paul II, um, and that he would disagree with his liberation th theology that has been kind of brought in by Francis, um, of course, cordially and in, in this tradition of, you know, it's all valid, you're, you know, the head of the church, uh, head of the church on earth. Um, but I did not read anything on, I, I suspect he hasn't talked very much about Dukes at all because he was in this post-war era and, it, and it, it was no longer quite the topic du jour. Um, and my suspicion is that if he were to talk about it, it would be quite similar. And that's, you know, he had no occasion to change the existing doctrine. Thank you so much. And now please join me in thanking the panelists for their presentation.